Hello, hello everyone, uh, Ryan from Avatar Aquatics and welcome, welcome to the stream. We had a little bit of a problem earlier with the audio, so hopefully this time we will be fine. Um, today's main goal is for me to go through the scientific article uh, about breeding a mono shrimp. And this was written like about 40 years ago, so uh, hopefully, um, even though it's you know kind of dense and a lot of people have told me a uh, reached out and told me that the articles that I linked in the description of my videos are, are kind of dense uh, Going through them together on a live stream would help out. So, you know, if you're here um, Good for you. And if you're watching the replay, I'm um, do a little bit of a housekeeping first and then uh, we'll talk about this and I'll put a little a link down below or on the on the on the scroll bar for you to actually just skip forward uh, overall this uh, this 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 particular article is called The Complete Larval Development of, um, of, the, of the Caridina japonica. And uh, here, I'll go ahead and just share my screen now. This article is probably the only article that out there talks about and describes the uh, maturity, the, the development of the... Um, of the Amano shrimp. So when I was going through doing my research in the very beginning, I came across this article. It was what I, it was the first one I read and probably the only one that uh, actually has any, you know, bit of, bit of actual knowledge in there. So I'm really grateful for this article. However, um, there are little bits of pieces about it that I'm, I want to pick apart. Um, so just when you go through and read the entire thing. So Starting off, uh, one of the biggest things that you should look for whenever you start reading a scientific article is you need to look at, in context, where, where was it published, what time, and all the other factors surrounding who wrote this article, right? So we see that this was written in 1984, about 40 years ago, right? Um, back then, I'm sure the aquarium hobby looked very, very different. Amano shrimps were introduced in the hobby like in, in 1980s, in the 1980s. So it was written right around the time when Amano shrimps were starting to gain popularity. Okay, so people probably didn't have a, like the Amano shrimp did not have a wide distribution as much as it does, as it does now all around the world. And then if you look at it, it was published in the Zoological Society of Japan. That sounds like a pretty decent journal, so uh, probably credible. And then after that, you have to look at who were these guys that wrote this. And throughout the entire article, uh, you want to look at sort of, are they trying to promote anything? Um, like, what are the conflict of interests? For example, if I was a fish uh, food company, a manufacturer, uh, and I start hiring all these scientists to do research on my fish food compared to other brand names. If I was, a, if you were the scientist that I hired, you would be in a little bit of trouble if you just did the research. Suddenly said, you know, this Ryan's fish food sucks. Don't get it, right? So when we're thinking about are they trying to promote anything? Even though this is a scientific article, it can still have bias. So we're gonna to try to uh, see, like, like be, just be aware of it when you're reading an article like this. Another thing is this article is dense and it's probably something that you would read in a high level college biology course. So we're gonna to try to break it down, make it easy. But you know, if this is challenging to you, it's challenging to everyone, it is it's hard. Um, so good job if you are following along. And then the last thing I want to say is I have another article uh, over here, Dietary Effects of Phytoplankton and zo Zooplankton on Larval Survival, Duration, and Growth of Four Caridina Species. And this one includes Caridina multidentata, which is the scientific name for a mono shrimp. Um, and I'm going to try to reference um, this article sometimes. But overall, we're going to be focusing on the original article because that other article was written in uh, 2020. Okay, so let's get started on this. 
The first thing that we're going to look at is the abstract. Okay, so the abstract is basically the one or two paragraph summary about this article. If you were doing research like on Google Scholar, which is a great place uh, if you've never been to before, just Google Scholar. It's, a, it's like a website or a service that Google provides and you can look up a lot of scientific articles that would normally be hidden behind a paywall. So the, uh, uh, the bulk of research on the Amano shrimp is written in Japanese because lo and behold, the Amano shrimp comes from Japan and Taiwan. So if you can't read Japanese, there's a problem. It's kind of hard to find English translations, but this one obviously 40 years ago already has this translation. I'm happy to have found it. So the abstract is going to tell you whether or not you want to keep reading the article. So if you're skimming through all the abstracts, it usually contains what the research question was, what they were trying to do, um, and how they went about doing this um, research or doing this experiment and then lastly they'll tell you what the results are so those are like the three main uh, parts to an abstract so let's just read through this the Japanese atyid shrimp now I don't know how to spell this word or I don't really know how to pronounce this word it sounds like atid or atyid where you're gonna go with either one no one's ever taught me how to say this and I don't really know so Caradina japonica demand Okay, Caradina japonica is the old scientific name for the Amano shrimp. And so if you see Caradina multidentata versus Caradina japonica, just know that they're the same shrimp, the Amano shrimp. Spawns small eggs measuring 0.5 by 0.31 millimeters at spawning. So overall, they're very, very small. We're talking half a millimeter, okay? The larvae show optimum growth under rearing conditions of 16.9 ppt, so that's parts per thousand, this little symbol here, salinity, 25 degrees Celsius water temperature, and by feeding an artificial diet. So, an art so, so 25 degrees Celsius is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit for my American viewers, okay? Used in, used in fish aquaculture mixed with a small amount of rice bran. So right off the bat, we already know that this paper is different from what I suggested in my videos because this paper is saying we want 17 parts per thousand and we feed artificial diet mixed with a small amount of rice bran. So I'm gonna get to that in a second. We can just keep moving on for now. The hatched larvae develop to juveniles through nine zoeal stages without a megalopa over about one month. A megalopa is like the stage that a lot of crustaceans have right before they metamorph. And it's like a, it's basically just like a very, very well-developed juvenile or not, not juvenile, very well-developed plankton form. Okay. So this shrimp doesn't have one. Zoeal stages and the first juvenile are described and illustrated in detail. These are compared morphologically and ecologically in some important characteristics with those of several atyids reported previously. This whole sentence is just them telling you what they did in this article. The present species shows the typical larval development of the group of atyids characterized by small eggs like C. weberi. Now this C stands for Caradina, okay, because when you're reading an article a lot of times species have this really long scientific names and so what they'll usually do is they'll mention the full name for the first time and then they will start abbreviating. So we talked about Caradina up top here, right? So for this one, Caradina is abbreviated to C. So C. weberi is just Caradina weberi. The number of zoeal stages is nine, which is larger than the, for the other members of the same genus and smaller than that for eight atya innocuous and we don't care about this because this is not the same shrimp that we're doing we don't care about them we can just ignore that this because we're only reading this article in context of breeding the amano shrimp so we only really need to pay attention to that part but you should read the entire thing because sometimes there's little bits of knowledge scattered throughout the stocked eye appear in the second zoeal stage as in almost all atyids bearing small or medium-sized eggs on my, I think on my full presentation video, we talked about this, stocked eyes appear in the second stage, and that's how you're gonna be able to tell 
that your shrimp are starting to uh, molt. The first periopod is completed morphologically in the third stage and all periopods in the seventh stage. This word here, when you're reading a scientific article like this, and if you're not super good with shrimp anatomy, which I am not, you should just highlight it, Google it, learn about it, okay? It's, there's nothing wrong with just Googling something. I happen to know that this word means the walking legs on the shrimp, okay? The walking legs, like the, the front ones that they walk on, not the swimmerettes in the back, because those are, those are different, those are, those are pleopods, but periopod, is the walking leg. So the first pair of walking legs are completed in the third stage. Okay, so the pleopods are first recognized as buds in the sixth stage. We talked about this in my complete presentation, um, if you look. And then the uropod is completed in the fourth stage. The uropod is the tail part, okay? So I have a shrimp anatomy picture pulled up for you guys. Um, Periopods, like you see here, are these when they labeled it for us. And then this back here is the uropod. And then the, so for shrimp, they have two on the outside, which are called exopods, out, exo, and then two in the middle, which are endopods, and then one towards the very middle, in the very middle, which is the telson, T-E-L-S-O-N. So look for that, because it's gonna come up. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm going to try to monitor it as well as I could. Okay, so introduction, just to give you a little bit of background information, right? Based on egg size, the shrimps of the family uh, Atidiidae are developed, are divided into three groups. This word here, I cannot pronounce, but um, I know what it means. It's just, a, you know, remember like, um, did King something come over for good spaghetti, right? This is the family name so so when we talk about family this family includes shrimps like the amano shrimp the neocaridina species so if you've ever kept cherry shrimp blue dream shrimp or any of those neocaridina david eye shrimp this includes this is part of it okay and then also your bamboo shrimps the bamboo shrimps are the ones with the fan with the fan hands that like to sit in the current and grab stuff out of and eat it like that so all these shrimps fall under this family Larval development has been described completely in several species of each group. The larva, larvae of the large egg are treated by shen, blah, 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 some random authors who's done that before. And those of the medium eggs by small, some more random authors. On the other hand, blah, 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 all these guys describe the larvae of the small egg group. Caridina multidentata falls under this last group here, okay? So although hunt did not mention the egg sizes of all these other all the all these other shrimps these two species probably belong to the small egg group because the hatch larvae are small and there are many zoeal stages in general the large egg aids usually have a landlocked life cycle we know this right this is remember this paper was written 40 years ago so were were neocaridina that popular 40 years ago probably not probably not in general, the large egg aids usually have a landlocked life cycle. They're just saying that Neocaridina are freshwater only. They're landlocked, only freshwater, which we know to be true. And spawn a comparative small number of eggs which show di direct development. By contrast, small egg species have numerous eggs and complex larval stages of long duration which require saline media for development. If you've ever kept Neocaridina fish or shrimps, you know that when the females become buried, they lay probably anywhere from like 25 to 50, 60 eggs at a time. For a mono shrimp, we're talking thousands, hundreds and thousands of eggs at a time. That's what they're saying. And they're saying that the, the smaller the egg, the more likely it is for them, for the, for the shrimp to require a saltwater phase in their life cycle. Okay, that's just their introduction, this broad general statement. The Japanese atyid, Caridina japonica de man, belongs to the small egg group and occurs naturally in the upper part of rivers in southern Japan and Taiwan. We talked about this. I got this information from this paper. That's why I cited it. Therefore, the likelihood of long development time in the larval stages has been predicted 
previously. So just by knowing this, that knowing that these shrimp live at the upper parts of rivers, we know that when the female releases the actual larvae, okay, they have to float down in fresh water towards the ocean. This means that the first stage, right after they hatch out from the egg, has to be able to go from fresh water to salt water. So if you were doing this from the very beginning, you had no idea, you would know that, number one, you do not put the females in salt water. A lot of times, I, I, I look, I, I browsed through a lot of forums about breeding the Amano shrimp, um, especially when I was starting out. And a lot of people are saying, you put the female in salt water. Okay, that is not true. And this statement should tell you that. The general characteristics of the larvae of this species are discussed in relation to the Aeid group. We don't really care about that. We just care about the spawning and the breeding. You can read about it, but I'm not going to talk about it during stream because that's going to take us another three hours. And um, I'm sure you guys have better things to do on a Wednesday night. Oh, where I go? Okay, specimens are captured during August 1979 and May 1981 from the Shiwagi River. I was not born back then, okay? Um, and I don't really know where this is in Japan, so we can just skip that. It doesn't really matter for us. We just care about the water conditions. Measurements and counts were made of eggs from ovigorous. This means females who are egg-bound or ready to lay eggs or already eggs. We can probably get, uh, I'm going to Google this because I'm not 100% sure. Bearing or modified for the purpose of bearing eggs. Okay, so probably already buried females. Preserved in 10% neutral formalin, just a preservative, using a binocular microscope with an ocular grid. A binocular microscope has two um, little, two eye sights. And an ocular grid just basically helps you measure things, okay? And then these are preserved, okay? So, 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 so the eggs get preserved in this formalin. formalin. Let's talk about the rearing conditions because that's, that's what the next part is, right? Females were reared with males in aerated aquaria under the following conditions. Water temperature 20 plus or minus 1 degrees Celsius. I think that's about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Surface lumen, uh, 1400 lux. That's, that's just a measurement of light, okay? In photo period, 14 light, 10 dark. So basically the light cycle is 14 hours of light, 10 hours of darkness every day. For me, I've always just used the aquarium lighting. It does the trick, it's fine. Um, however, I will say the, the Amano shrimps tend not to become buried during the winter. Um, even though you feed the same, everything is the same, they just don't develop eggs for me. You know, I have a heater on it at around 75. I have the lights going on, but I guess with the way the, the light cycle is, the females just don't, don't develop eggs. And then as soon as it got warmer, for some reason, they just start developing eggs again. So I'm not sure if this 14 light, 10 dark cycle is going to trigger them, but I know that this 14 light, 10 dark cycle is about how much sun a summer day gets, okay? So daily feeding employed an artificial diet for the IU, AU, Plecoglossus, I don't know what this is, it sounds like a fish, so we're just going to Google it. So it looks like it's a fish. And so what they're saying is an artificial diet like fish food made by this Nippai Shrimp Feed Incorporated in Japan. I don't know what this com company is. And since this paper was written four years ago, I don't know if they're still around, nor does it really matter, because um, you know, a model shrimp readily become buried. As long as you have the, the daylight cycle right, you feed well in your aquarium. After pre-mating ecstasis and copulation, this just means, this word here just means molt. So pre-mating molt. We all, we, we know, uh, this, we should know at this point that Amato shrimps and, uh, and even Neocaridina, when, they, when the females molt, they then hide and release pheromones, the shrimp, the male shrimps go crazy, and then they find the female and mate with the female. So after this whole thing happens, a female with newly attached eggs 
where am I? I lost my, okay. Was placed alone in 100 mils, which is one liter beaker under the aquarium conditions specified above. So we already talked about the aquarium conditions we talked um, above and it's basically just all this stuff right here. Within 24 hours of hatching, the larvae were individually separated into 100 mil beakers maintained without aeration at 25 degrees Celsius, plus or minus one, uh, uh, a thousand, sorry, not a thousand four hundred lux, 14 light day, uh, 10 dark cycles. So between this sentence here and this sentence, they're, they're basically saying that, okay, we had the buried females, we separated the buried females, and then we just kept them in these conditions until they gave birth. They don't tell us how long it takes for this to happen, right? So you kind of have to, like there's information in here that the researchers did not think was necessary to their project. However, our project is we want to breed these shrimps. So that's a potential pitfall. That's a potential lack of knowledge that we have to figure out ourselves. We have a lot of information from this article, but we don't have all the information because the researchers were focused on comparing the larvae of the of the mono shrimps to the other shrimps that other people have already talked about. Okay, so within 24 hours of hatching, the larvae were individually separated, so they did not have aeration in these beakers. And we know that the temperature compared to up above where the adults were kept was higher. So earlier I said about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're at 25 Celsius, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Same light, same night and day cycle. And every day the larvae were transferred by pipette to another set of beakers provided with fresh media and food. So if you are raring in the lab, okay, and it was your job and you got paid to do this, you are probably going to do every day night, uh, every day water changes from the larvae in the 100 mil beakers but since I'm at home and I don't want to do every day we kind of had to adapt their sort of method for our purposes okay it's all about ad adapting the information these guys presented to yourself that's that's the whole point about why we're doing this experiments for food preference and for defining optimum salinity concentrations of conditions of the rearing medium were carried out using the above rearing method so this 100 mil beaker method, these guys were trying to figure out food preference and salinity. But they also said the larval development stages were studied from larvae reared under the most favorable feed and salinity conditions. So they were not looking for the sick and dying larvae. They were only using the healthiest ones when they are talking about the development stages. And then lastly, measurements of size and the duration of each zoeal phase were observed on larvae reared community in large communally in large numbers in a large glass aquarium that they give you the dimensions with a recirculating water supply system in which the larvae fed on diatoms so it's a very very long sentence cymbella and navicula adhering to the sand bottom and glass wall as well as on the artificial diet so they're saying that the duration of each larval phase were observed in shrimps that were fed diatoms on a sand bottom and glass wall so on a big big aquarium or 40 by 74 by 40 centimeters as well as on the artificial diet so they also fed artificial diet so these guys are saying they kept larvae in very different concentrations in very different conditions specimens of zoe zo zoeo zoe zoa zoa and juveniles for examination were immobilized in isotonic water. Isotonic water just means like the same uh, salinity, if you will, by chilling and dissecting in 50% ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is just something that's like, I think a little more viscous, so it's easier to see under the microscope and the the little baby amano shrimps aren't gonna like zoom around. Cause it, it, like when I was making my videos, it was very hard to get those guys to stay still. Drawings were made with the aid of a camera lucida, and that's just a sort of projector for your microscope so that you can trace out 
what the drawing, what like what the what the babies look like on like it'll project it onto your desk, and you could just trace it out on a piece of paper basically. All measurements were made on five living individuals representing each larval stage using a binocular microscope with an ocular grid. The total length was measured from the rostral apex to the end of the telson, excluding setae. Setae, setae, and the carapace length. Okay, so this first sentence is just saying how they measured the total length. It doesn't really matter for us, but if you really want to know, okay, rostral apex. This is the rostrum, the little horn at the top of a shrimp. Apex is here, to the end of the telson. So this, the middle part, right? Look, if we had a cr lobster, um, because maybe we could look at this one. The telson is this middle part here, okay? And they said, excluding the setae. The setae are the little hairs at the back of this. So if you've ever had a lobster or a shrimp, you know that some of them have these little hairs at the back so they were excluding that they only did this one here and to the front of where the horn is on the rostrum same thing with a carapace and we don't really i don't really want to talk about this it's not it doesn't matter to us okay the results females of caridina japonica has an average of 1872.7 eggs that's a lot of eggs for one female Right, and they give you the range. So the, the smallest female, the female with the least amount of eggs was 747. And the highest amount of eggs that they found on one female was 4,391. I don't know how they counted that. They probably just estimated. Um, but this N equals 34 here, you're going to see this in a lot of articles. And that just means the number of females that these guys counted. Okay, N equals 34, just the number of samples that they took which were oval in shape and of dimensions, this, n equals 55, so they measured 55 eggs here, soon after spawning and a little bigger just before hatching in 20 eggs, okay? A few eggs began to hatch sporadically from the 25th day, range 21st to 28, n equals five after spawning. So they're, they're saying like, okay, some, some hatched out a little earlier, I remember yesterday, in the beginning, I talked about how there wasn't uh, information on that here, okay? So that's what I'm talking about here. Zoyal ingested all of five kinds of food offered to them, uh, green algae. However, green algae and a mixture of these algae and the rotifer, Brachionis placatilis. And remember, in the beginning, I talked about how this paper was very different, made from, um, uh, written in 2020, and these guys swore on the rotifer plus tetrasalmus. So this is a different uh, in opinion or different in um, experimental outcomes for them. Could not maintain larvae in healthy condition. On the other hand, rice bran gave a longer survival time from hatching, but the larvae never metamorphed on it. And you'll see this on these two charts here, which is the important parts. Created power, powder of the artificial diet mixed with the rice bran appeared to be the best food for larvae producing 80% survival to metamorphosis. So they're saying the artificial diet plus the rice bran was the best way of keeping these guys alive to, and for them to metamorph on. Because if you just fed rice bran, it would not be enough and they would still die even though they would live longer. The effects of various salinity levels on the growth of out of zoea, zoe, 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 whatever, is shown in table two, this one here. Normal development of, and we'll go over the tables in just a second. Normal, normal development of zoea, zoa, was ensured by brackish or pure seawater, but not by freshwater or low salinity media. So they cannot survive. They cannot survive in fresh water. You're going to hear people say, you know, there was this one time where I found a little baby Amano shrimp in my tank, in my community tank. I didn't have to do anything. Chances are they did not have Amano shrimps in their tank to begin with, or it came as a hitchhiker when they bought plants or other fish. Okay. And uh, after metamorphosis, the juveniles grew normally in low salinities or freshwater, we know this to be true, 
in fresh water at 20 plus or minus 1, remember this is 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the juveniles extist every six days. We know this word means molt and grew 0.2 millimeters in carapace length. Carapace is sort of the head of the shrimp compared to the abdomen or the body, okay? So they grew a little bit bigger after each molt. For juveniles with a carapace length of more than 2.0 millimeters, ecstasis took place every seven days. So it took a little longer for them. If, you're, if they're a little bit bigger, it, it took them a little longer, okay? So let's go to talk about the tables um, because that's really what's left of this of this article table one says always read the title when you're reading the when you're reading a, a, um, a scientific article because it tells you a lot of information the larval rearing of Caradina japonica demand on different foods at 25 degrees Celsius and 16.9 parts per thousand salinity so half the strength of seawater at 25 or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Food, they fed pure green algae, survival, the amount that survived to, to actual juvenile stage and where you're able to move them back to freshwater was 0%, no, no, nothing, nothing survived just on green algae alone. And so if you're looking on the forum and you're, people are recommending phytoplankton, point them to this article or point them to my channel, because I always need more views, and let them know that more than likely, just feeding phytoplankton is not going to cut it. You will not have success, according to the Hayashi and Hamano paper, and also on my own experiments, not feeding, not supplementing with something else will not be helpful, essentially. Hatching to death, so these numbers here, it tells you down below, mean duration is shown with range in parentheses. So the average days, okay, it took for these, for the shrimp raised on green algae alone to die was 11.6 days. And that's consistent with what I found where there is a big die off around day 10 to 12, okay? And the, the range, so the earliest that they found this, the, the fish, the fish the shrimp to die was on day eight and the latest was 16 right and of course because they all died in the zero percent survival there is no value here for hatching to metamorphosis it's so on rotifers with green algae so what this whole paper is saying okay this other paper is saying survival they found was zero percent and it only took them eight days to, to die okay with a range of six to eleven so right off the bat their results is a direct different or, or these results are a direct um i guess counter example of what these guys found and to sum this up these guys basically said you need live tetracelmus you need live rotifers in order to successfully breed a mono shrimp at 25 parts per thousand this is what this paper said Okay, and these since this one was written in 2020, okay, they actually referenced this paper here, and they were like, "We actually found wrong the like we actually found a different uh, outcome." Anyways, on rice brand alone, these guys survived for 45.9 days, but none metamorphed. Okay, and then the last two is what's important for us. Artificial diet for IU culture, so artificial fish food, 50% survived to metamorphosis, okay, with a hatching to death. So around day 19, oh, some of them started dying. And then hatching to metamorphosis. On the 36th day, these guys, on average, started to metamorph into juvenile shrimp. And the reason for that, I'm willing to bet, is because this artificial diet contains more nutrition, more amino acids, more lipids, more fat, more carbohydrates than these options alone, okay? It's a more complete diet. And that's why we supplement with, with, um, with artificial foods. So my method was to use tetracelmus, green algae, get them past that initial part where they're only able to eat these green algaes. 
And then, as they get bigger and they're able to hunt and scavenge for more nutritious foods, you start feeding them artificial diets. You know, you could grind it up in a mortar and pestle, just you could, or you could feed Hikari first bites or another very, very small golden pearls, micron, whatever it's called. Get them the nutrition that they need to metamorph. And an artificial diet with rice bran, again, we're varying the amount of nutrition and the type of nutrition because by feeding more types of food, you're giving them a, a more complete nutritional profile. This is going to be um, true 80, 90% of the time. And so by giving them more nutrition, 80% survived to metamorphosis. Hatching to death, some of them died on eight point, day 8.5, but these guys, you'll notice, also metamorphed earlier than just being on the artificial diet alone. So this chart should tell you that you need more than just green algae. Number two, you need more than just feed. Oh, okay, okay. The, the second thing is you need to feed artificial diets. Now this artificial diet is kind of tricky because if we go back up to here, and don't worry, I'm not going to read it again, but if we go up, we know that these guys were doing a water change every single day and they would only pipette out the little babies and transfer them, transfer them to new media and new food. We're not going to be able to do that unless you really want to in a hobbyist setup. So we need a filter. We need a larger tank, but we still need to make sure that their environment is clean and they have fresh food every single day. So then let's talk about the salinity. I think this is this paper is the reason why a lot of people say we need brackish water. And you know, I was talking to one of my subscribers and he had success with 17 parts per thousand, but the ones that were developing in 35 parts per thousand grew faster. And they were out of that salt water phase faster than the 17 parts per thousand ones. So when you are, you know, the, the salt water stage is always a little bit tricky. It's a little shaky for everyone. So for me, I want to sort of um, decrease that time, shrink that time down to as little time in the salt water as possible, which is why I'm using 35 parts per thousand. So let's talk about this table. It's very similar to the other one. Salinity, zero parts per thousand, no one made it. 8.5 parts per thousand, no one made it. At 16.9, which is 17 parts per thousand, 66% survived. Okay, and uh, about 27 days until they started dying on average, and then 33 days to metamorph out. Salinity, 25-ish, 11% um, survived to metamorphosis, took them 31 days. So you'll see that as we increase the salinity, the hatching to metamorphosis time decreases, right? It went from 33 days to metamorph to 31 to 26. So for me, I chose 35 to decrease that time and also because it just worked better for me than 17. When I first saw, saw this one, I was like, okay, so it looks like 17 days is the time, or 17 parts per thousand is the way to go. But when I tried, 17 parts per thousand killed all of my Amano shrimps. So it's, it's you know, maybe things were different 40 years ago, or maybe um, we have different species now, but for me, at least, 35 is the way to go, and that's why I recommend people start with two containers, different salinities, and then figure out which one is better for them. Do, 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 we already talked about this. Adam, after metamorphosis, the juveniles grew normally in low salinities or fresh waters. They didn't tell us anything about transferring them, acclimating them. So I had to figure that part out myself. Um, in fresh water at 20, so they went back to 20 degrees Celsius, the juveniles molted every six days. Oh, we talked about this already. So description of larvae, and then we could just end it there because if you want to go ahead and read through all of 
the nine different stages you can, but I'm not gonna have time to do that on the stream here, but just to show you, these guys have really, really nice pictures. Um, and if you watch my presentation, a lot of that information is repeated. So I'm gonna go back up to description of larvae. Nine zo zoeal stages, which are easily distinguished by each other by the number of segments of the antennular and antenna flagella, antennal flagella and my morphological differences in the appendages. We're never going to be able to count this, okay? No zoeal swim actively and the movement is carried out in reverse condition using the exopods of the thoracic appendages. We already know this. They swim backwards. I talk about it. Um, and they do this little thing where they move the water in front of them and they go like tail first through the water. However, juveniles swim in the normal manner using the pleopods for propulsion and walk on the bottom using the endopods of the peripods. So just using their little walking legs. The fact that no zoeal swim or zoa stayed swim actively is very tough to get right because we need to keep the, keep the bottom very, very clean if these guys don't swim actively. If they're always hanging out on the bottom, they're gonna get attacked by bacteria. And I talk about this a lot in my presentation, but overall, that's what this paper is saying. Um, the most important thing is down here in the charts itself. A, a little bit of advice, when you read it through a research article and they start citing all of the things, sort of scroll down to the very bottom, I'm sorry this hurts your eyes, where they start referencing different or other things. Because a lot of times, um, there are going to be even more articles for you to read down in the references that are related. And then also, if you go to the, um, discussion okay if you read through the discussion it usually puts their experiment in context with other experiments that have been done before them and sort of explains like why is this important why did we do this experiment okay so reading the discussion is really really helpful and um that's about it basically for this one it's just saying that 17 parts per thousand feeding artificial diet plus rice bran, okay? Um, and back to the other article, we're not gonna have time to go through this entire thing, but if I were to show you, these guys did three different types of shrimp, okay? The Caridina multidentata, which is the Amano shrimp, the Caridina serratirose rostris, I've never even heard of that shrimp, and then Caridina typhus, which is the Australian mono shrimp that I talked about a little bit. Es essentially, they're all very similar. Um, Caridina multidentata seems to be one that doesn't really feed in the beginning. However, like I said in my presentations, there is varying degrees of that, at least for what I found. What I found. And you know, we talked about preserved. Oh, this, this one's important. Um, they're basically saying that for what they found in 2020 is the preserved tetracelmus is not as good as the tetracelmus that is live and cultured and like live phytoplankton. So that's why I linked the live tetracelmus in the, in the, in the description below. Um, and so with this one, it's a little bit more complicated because you kind of have to sift through three different types of shrimp and three different sets of data, um, which is why we're not going to do this one today. Um, let's see. What was I going to talk about? I know I was going to talk about something here. Okay, yeah, okay, there it is. So if I were to hopefully zoom in a little bit, um, you guys can see these different colors, right? And PT stands for preserved tetracelmus. 
CT stands for cultured tetraselmus, so live tetraselmus. R stands for rotifer, and so PTR just stands for preserved tetraselmus plus live rotifers. CTR means uh, cultured tetraselmus and live rotifers. So what you'll see here is the number of days. This is the, remember, this is the um, Amato shrimp one, the second set here, C and D. You'll see that throughout the days, the percentage that survived to the molting of the, um, or, or that survived to metamorphosis, not molting, sorry. The highest one, okay, is, is the purple. And if we look down to here, we know purple is cultured tetraselmus, so live phytoplankton plus rotifers. So after looking at this paper, I was like, hmm, maybe I need live rotifers. Well, the, the problem with rotifers is number one, it's another investment, more uh, places to, you have to culture the rotifers. And also, if you accidentally, okay, if you accidentally get even one single rotifer in your phytoplankton batch, you're done for because the phytoplankton, the rotifer will eat, 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 and it will reproduce, clone itself, and within one or two weeks, you're gonna have a bunch of rotifers and zero phytoplankton. So do not ever, if you're, if you're looking, like you can try rotifers if you want, but there is no reason for you to do that, at least not for a mono shrimp. You, you do it through the graded artificial food powder food, Hikari First Bites, we're in the 20, we're 2021, we have a lot of different options for us now. We don't have to, we don't have to do rotifers. The reason why they did rotifers is because these guys were trying to figure out things that are available to the shrimp in nature, right? No one's going out and feeding Hikari First Bites, uh, throwing that in the ocean, right? But artificial diet is, is better. We know this from the other paper. Hayashi et Tomato. In this paper, they also said, look, like the only the only ones that have survival rates that are higher than zero, so this orange reddish one is about 10% survival. And that's on the cultured tetraselmus alone, right? Which is very similar to what Hayashi and Hamano found. Only green algae is a very low survival rate. But as soon as you add something else to that green algae, add another type of food, your survival rate increases by a lot. Like, like this is up to about 70% survival rate. So that's why my recommendation for you is to use green algae in the very beginning because that's one of the only things that these guys will eat. Green algae plus artificial food once they get a little bit older and that's going to give you the best result. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go back to my webcam. I hope you guys enjoyed this, um, this whole live stream where we read all about the, um, the, 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 the hard nitty gritty things. If you guys have any questions, please, please let me know. Uh, I would be happy to answer them. And uh, if you want to read over these articles yourself, you're more than welcome to. And the, and the link of that is in the description of my, um, of, my, of my breeding presentation. I'll also put that down in this one um, once, once we finish this, this, uh, this live stream. Another thing that I wanted to update you on was my German Blue Rams. And um, it seems like the, my favorite fish, the Romeo's Tetras and the Cardinals, um, are getting really, really fat when I'm conditioning the German Blue Rams because they're all in the same, they're all in the same tank. So, you know, maybe that means I can spawn the other fish. But for now, um, you know, I'm looking at the cardinal tetras, and it's it's possible. I think it's possible that I can actually raise the babies um, without giving too much away. It's possible that I can raise the babies. And the German blue rams, if you were wondering, um, I looked at the like the first day of free swimming, and I fed brine shrimp, 
and I waited a little bit, and I went and looked at their bellies, and um, I don't think they're big enough for brine shrimp. They're either not eating today, or they're just not big enough. Um, so you really need to look for things like uh, paramecium, which is like infusoria. I have a video on that, but, but you really need infusoria for the first week or so, because these guys are not not eating the brine shrimp. And what I did was um, I ended up adding a little bit of moss into their container. Um, and you know, I already have an infusoria culture because I, I started that like a long time ago and it just it just keeps going. Oh, to maintain a culture of infusoria, it's actually it's actually not that hard. Um, so I add fish food, some aquarium water, and sometimes I'll add some moss, okay? because the moss already contains a lot of microorganisms. But after about two weeks or so, it starts to decrease in production. So at that point, I will sort of siphon off the bottom because that one has a lot of like gross, icky stuff on the bottom. I'll just you know pipe it out or turkey baste around the bottom and I'll do a 50% water change and then I'll add a fresh fish food and that kicks up another bacterial bloom because we only switched out 50% of the water, the paramecium are still there. So then we have a like a fast track way of getting more paramecium. And then once you do that, it's very easy to subculture it into another cup. So I'll, I'll have one that's a mature one, one that's developing, and that way I can you know seed or inoculate the developing one with uh, paramecium from the mature culture. And so throughout the winter, I just kept doing that back and forth. Like when, when this one's now mature, this guy's starting to decrease in productivity. So I'll do that water change, I'll siphon out the bottom, add some more fish food, get that bacterial bloom going, and then redoing the other side. So just back and forth, back and forth and I managed to keep that paramecium culture going very, very strong. Um, and then the, the other thing was I tried microworms too big. Don't even, don't even try that uh, first day. Always, I think, at least for German blue rams, can add a little bit of baby brine shrimp, see if they'll take it, but the most, um, probably the most useful one is gonna be uh, paramecium or any type of infusoria. And if you don't have any of that, just add a little bit of moss to your culture. Don't add fish food. You do not want to make an infusoria culture um, in the one in your in your German blue rams. But 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 yeah, that's that's how I'm going to feed him for the first week or so. And then um, I don't think I don't think there's like anything else pressing that I wanted to tell you guys about. So I'm probably going to go ahead and end the stream. Now it's been 50 some minutes, which I think is a good time to end the, the, the stream. So I'll see you guys.